morning, everybody. Do you like the way Mike said Nicaragua? So we're building schools in Nicaragua. <laughs> hey, did you ever dismiss something that uh, you thought was insignificant only to find out later that it was very significant? You know, history is full of examples of this. Like when, when uh, uh, the emperor uh, Ferdinand was killed, uh, Franz, Joseph Franz Ferdinand, in 1914, assassinated, nobody realized that it was going to be the event that caused World War I. And um, in my lifetime, when the uh, Watergate break-in took place, nobody in their wildest dreams thought of it was of any significance, and it eventually brought down a president. You know, there was this one event that is mind-blowing to me. A guy by the name of Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis. He was a Hungarian physician in the 1800s. And in 1847, he oversaw a hospital in Vienna, Austria. And he noticed something that was quite phenomenal. <clears throat> there was two maternity wards in this hospital. In one of them, the death rate for these moms giving birth was three to five times higher than in the other one. And then nobody knew why. So he began to investigate, try to fix the problem. Well, the first thing he, he said was, you know, over here, they have them give birth on their back. And over here, it's on their sides. So they said, okay, everybody on your sides. That didn't change the birth rate. This side over here, where they gave birth on their back, was still three to five times higher. So then he realized that in this one over here, where the death rate was super high, a priest would ring a bell every time a, a mom died. They died of this thing called childbed fever. It was a mysterious disease. After you gave birth, all these women were getting childbed fever, childbed fever and dying. And these priests would ring a bell in this ward, not in this one. So that's it. When they ring a bell, the moms are going, mm, somebody else died, now I'm going to die, and they die. And so they said, no more bells, no more bell ringing. And it didn't change the, the death rate at all. Then he saw that doctors staffed the ward that had the high death rate, and midwives staffed the one that didn't. And doctors were more skilled, but then he saw doctors were allowed to do autopsies. And doctors were doing autopsies on people that had died and then going immediately into the delivery room and delivering babies. Now, this was before anyone knew about germs. The germ, germ theory was just that, a distant theory that nobody really bought. They had no idea that you could communicate something through touch. They had no idea that germs existed. So they couldn't figure it out. But because of the stench and all that, he, Dr. Semmelweis said, okay, look, here's what I'm asking you to do. After you do an autopsy, I want you to dip your hands into a chlorine solution, and then you can deliver a baby. So they said, well, we don't get it. We don't like it, but we'll do it. You're the boss. So they did it, and the death rate went down to almost nothing. All of a sudden, these women stopped dying. The problem was is the medical community of that day thought that was ridiculous. And they said, you guys are doing what? No, 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 no. They eventually fired Dr. Semmelweis. The doctors returned to their previous practices. And for decades, women continued to die because of this action. He had stumbled the fact of the simple act of washing your hands had the power of life and death over these young mothers. Well, the Bible talks about something that has an even greater power of life and death. And here it is, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. What you say has the power to bring life or death into situations you live in. This is a heavy thought, man, because the average person speaks about 16,000 words a day. Every day you write a 60-page book with your words. My wife writes a 100-page book. <laughs> it's a good book, but it's 60 pages. <laughs> Did you ever think that something was insignificant only to find out later it was quite significant? Wash your hands before delivering a baby. Psh, ridiculous. 
If you don't believe that there's great power in words, just think about right now things that were said to you years ago that you remember right now. It's coming to your mind right now. I mean, stuff 10, 20, 30, 40, if you're old like me, 50, 60 years ago. And it may have just been a passing comment, and you remember it. Like, I can remember in my 20s, I was taking up the game of golf. I sucked now, but I really sucked then. And, and I, my dad was a good golfer. And I remember we were playing golf, and there was a poster I saw at his golf club, and it said, Father-Son Tournament. And I remember, I said, hey, Dad, maybe someday we'll play that. And he goes, you? And, oh, it was like, I still remember to this day. He didn't mean anything bad by it, but, oh, man. I remember eighth grade, eighth grade, 1970, 47 years ago, I was going with a girl named Sylvia Artalejo. She was so pretty. Oh, man. I was walking her home, trying to get a kiss and all that kind of stuff. And then one day, her friend came to me in the playground. She says she wants to break up. She doesn't like you like that anymore. And, <laughs> oh, dude, I still remember it. Now, I always wanted to be an encourager with my words because uh, my dad, for the most part, except for that one time, he was one of the most encouraging people I ever met with his words. My dad was this larger-than-life personality. He was so funny. He was, he, he was like this legend in El Paso, Texas. He moved there in 1919 when he was just a little boy, and he lived there until he, he died in 1990. But he was this larger-than-life character. He sold real estate, and then he, um, people that got in trouble, he helped them get out of trouble. Enough said. So, um, but I saw this when I was a little kid. We were at a restaurant, my brother, my two sisters, my dad and I, and we're in this restaurant, and we're sitting there, and the waitress walks up. And, I, hey! and let's just say she probably had not received many compliments in her life. And she carried herself like that. She kind of carried herself like that. And she goes, you all want water? And he goes, yeah. And so she turns around, and she's at the little station behind us getting water. And I remember to this day, my dad, he says in a whisper to me across the table, louder than he needed to, he says, Robert, when she turns around, Look at her eyes. She has beautiful eyes. I'm thinking, yeah, they're so beautiful, they keep trying to look at each other. But anyway, um, <laughs> but dude, when my dad said that, I saw her, she heard, he wanted her to hear. She just straightened out, and she turned around just beaming, and she really was much more beautiful. And she was just, because she probably had not heard anything like that in years, maybe not in her life. And, she, I mean, now my dad was slick. We got great service that day. <laughs> but that's not why he did it. He just made her day with just a compliment. So I tried to emulate that. It didn't always work out well for me, though I tried. I remember, this is a true story. Why do people say it's a true story? Like the other ones are lies? No, anyway, it's a true story. <laughs> a true story. Dee and I were living in Kentucky. I was going to seminary. We were broke. And on my day with no classes, we were going to go get a burger. We went to Hardee's. Hardee's is the East Coast version of Carl's Jr., same company. So we walk into Hardee's. Dee Dee's behind me with, her, with our new baby, our little... Oy, calon. <laughs> Man, I'm glad I just said that. I could have said so many other things uh, with the power of my words, but not no more because I'm a better man. Yeah, yeah. I've been hanging out with Mike. I'm a better man. <laughs> Anywho, so I'm walking into this, this Hardee's. Dee Dee's behind me with our new baby. And I walk in, and there's a gal here and a guy there. And the gal is rather plain. So I'm going to make her day. So as I'm walking up, I say to the guy, I'm going to the pretty one over here. And then I get to the counter, and I realize that they're both girls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you're enjoying this. <laughs> and I'm just dying. Now, Dee Dee, who was supposed to stand behind me, she says she stick with me through thick and thin. She sees all of this goes down, she turns around and walks out and gets in the car. And I got to stand there just dying. Going, two cheeseburgers, two french fries, and two Diet Cokes, please, to go. 
and I have to wait for them to cook it. I'm just dying. <laughs> uh, and pay and walk out. And I just get in the car. I just go, oh, God. And Didi, so supportive, goes, mm-hmm. <laughs> now, if you have any doubt about the power of words, just look at this scripture that lays it out pretty clearly in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37. Let me tell you something, Jesus speaking. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation, and words can also be your damnation. Now, we're not talking about salvation by works. Salvation by words. No, that would be completely contrary to biblical teaching. The only thing that can save you is what Christ did on the cross for you in dying and rising from the dead. But what Jesus is saying is that words are powerful because they reveal what's in your heart. You listen to someone's words and it'll reveal what's in their heart. Now, this is not in your outline, but it's from the very first chapter of the book of the Bible. You might want to write this down. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Look at this example. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. From nothing, God spoke, and there was something. With words, God creates. With words, God calls. And we, in a much more limited fashion, because we are not God, but we are made in God's image, we can bring life or death with our words. Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. Words can bring life and words can bring death. Here's another example, also not in your outline, but just two chapters later, Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So with words, the enemy seduced Adam and Eve into rebellion, and hell was unleashed on earth. So God created all things, and it was good with words. The devil perverted it all by tempting Adam and Eve into sin with words. So how does God bring us back? How does God bring us back to himself? Well, not just with words, but with the word. Look at John chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, the Greek word for word is the Greek word logos, and what it means is the expression of a thought. In other words, what was in God's heart towards you and me who had rebelled and gone our own way and followed the wicked one, what was in God's heart towards us was love and a desire to bring back home, a desire to forgive, a desire to give another chance to. And so that was in God's heart, and so the Word became flesh. What was in God's heart was God became man. He became Jesus who is called the Word. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. By the way, we're just touching on that concept today. Next week, we're going to go into great, far greater detail. So God created with words. The devil perverted using words. And then God redeemed by sending the word. Even in his ministry, Jesus declared his purpose with words. So he's asleep in, the, in a little boat with his disciples. The wind is blowing. The rain is falling. The waves are crashing. This boat's about to sink. The disciples wake him up. Say, Jesus, we're about to die. Help. So Jesus gets up and says to the waves, peace, be still. Immediately, it was calm. While later, he's, his friend dies, Lazarus. Jesus hesitates and then goes to the house. They're all in mourning. 
Lazarus is in the tomb. Jesus stands up before the tomb and says, roll away the stone. Lazarus' sister says, whoa, 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 he's been dead four days. By now he's kind of funky. (laughs) Jesus says, roll away the stone. And then Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And out of the darkness of the tomb, Lazarus emerges wrapped in his grave clothes. Words are powerful. And on a human scale, God has given us the ability to speak life or death into any situation. In your home, you have the ability to speak life or death. At the job, life or death. In all of your relationships, life or death. Now, Dr. Semmelweis could not get his colleagues to wash their hands. They didn't buy it. So the death rates went back up with all of the accompanying suffering. Thousands of of, of babies that had no mom to raise them. Husbands who had no wife to, to be their partner. On and on and on. This, this unnecessary tragedy caused so much grief to Dr. Semmelweis that he eventually had a mental breakdown, lost his mind, and was committed to an asylum where he died two weeks after being admitted because after being beaten by the guards. Now, why did the medical community react this way? The same reason that we react skeptically when we're told that our words have the power on life or death. One, to believe it would be self-indicting. The physicians of the day said, you mean you tell me that I'm responsible for all of this unnecessary death? No way. Take him away. The other reason is it's just so simple. You're telling me that if we wash our hands in this chlorine solution, these young moms won't die? That's way too simplistic. Take him away. We do the same thing. You mean I've caused that much damage? In my home, with my wife, with my children, my co-workers, with my words. Oh, man, I'm just a joker. Come on, don't put that on me. Or something that simple, really thinking through how I use my words, is going to change whether I bring life or death into situations. It's too simple. But Dr. Semmelweis' plea, and I believe the Word of God's plea to us all is, just try it. So I'd like to share three things that will really help us begin to harness the power of our words. So the first thing we need to do, I think, is deal with the lifetime of words that still have a hold on us. I mean, we can hear some pretty rough stuff growing up at school, in our neighborhoods. And these things that we heard have a tendency to define us as we allow them to continue to have power over us. We continue to believe that they're true. It's like the old man who, he couldn't hear anything, man, until finally he got, was fit with the -the state-of-the-art Cadillac hearing aid. A month later, he came back to the doctor for a checkup, and the doctor says, so how's it going? He goes, this is incredible. I can hear everything. Doctor says, does your family like it? And he says, oh, they haven't told them I have it yet. And they say, what? And he goes, no, I just sit around listening to them talk about me. I've changed my will three times. (laughs) Many of us have been hurt by words. And I'm telling you, the sting, the hurt, the shaping, the agony sometimes that it's caused, there's only one way to be free from it. Only one way. We have to release the past through forgiveness. We, we, we have to let it go, not just into a vacuum, we have to let it go into God's hands and let God be their judge, not us. We need to resign from that position and let God be the judge. You know, Martin Luther King, who, wit- who experienced a lot of hateful stuff and witnessed a lot of hateful stuff, he said this, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. When when we forgive, when we release people from the things they said to us, we're not saying, I like you, I approve of what you did, I want to hang out again. No, 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 no. We are saying, I'm not going to allow the things you said to shape me or control me. I am now free. I forgive you. I release you to God. 1 Peter 4, 8 and 11 says, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one was speaking the very words of God. 
So as we begin to deal with the pain from the past and hurtful words that have shaped us, we now have to deal with reshaping our heart, having our heart recast. How do you do that? Well, the same way God created everything, with his word. So here it is. I'm encouraging you to each day speak God's word over your life. Look at the rest of the verse we started out with. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So what is the fruit of speaking and believing words of life? Man, freedom and joy. How do I do this? By speaking God's word over my life, over my relationships, over my decisions. Listen, listen to God speaking about his word in the book of Isaiah. We're, we're going to have, I think verse 11 is in your guide, but I'm going to read verse 10 just to give it some background. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so it is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. In other words, God sends his word into our life as seeds. And when we plant this seed, it will grow up and it will bear fruit. Always. It will not return empty. Look again at the second half of this verse. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, that is a promise from God. Now, I know we have seen abuses of this. All you got to do is watch late-night Christian television, which I do not recommend, and you'll see abuses of it. Oh, you just need to confess a Cadillac. God will give you a Cadillac. Or you need to, to just declare a perfect health and you'll never be sick again. That is, that is all counterfeit application of this truth. But just because you see a counterfeit doesn't mean there's a real. The reason that there are counterfeits is because there are. There is the real. You'll never see a counterfeit $13 bill because there ain't no real $13 bill. There's only counterfeits of what is real. Same with this truth. Just because it's been abused and just because oftentimes it's been spawned from bad theology doesn't mean it's real. Here's the real. The only way you will counteract the negative shaping of your soul by harmful words that you were told is by hearing, believing, and walking in the truth. And it starts by speaking the truth of God's word over your life. I had to do this yesterday. I'm going through a tough time right now. And I was riding my motorcycle, which is my therapy, and I had to speak God's word over my life, my career, my marriage, everything. I was just speaking God's truth over my life. Let's just, let's just try it. Whatever seeds you plant is the fruit that you're going to eventually eat. And if you speak and buy into words like, you're worthless, you're a failure, you're a walking disaster that God barely puts up with then that's going to be the fruit you eat. So let's do the opposite. Let's do what God wants us to do. So here's a declaration that I encourage, that I use. Declare this over your life and over your family. I am a child of the king today, and the evil one cannot touch me. Well, where do I get that? John 1, 12. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Or Ephesians 2, 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Or 1 John 5, 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin, but the one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. It's not saying that you won't go through tough times. That's a counterfeit application. It means that tough times, no matter how bitter they might be, will not touch the real you because the real you belongs to God. For some, the enemy starts out each day with this thought on, in your mind, I am condemned by my sin today. Man, you need to declare, I need to declare, I am not condemned by my sin today, but I have been set free by God's grace. Romans 8 and scripture after scripture for some of you, you start out your day this way. Man, I wonder if I'm going to make it through today. 
And nobody ever mess with me today because I will take their head off. So here's your declaration. I have plenty of grace to give people today because of the grace God has given me. 1 John 2, 11, Ephesians 4, 32. I've listed them in your guide. Man, I can be gracious, kind, and forgiving, and loving today because that's what God has shown me over and over and over and over again. You get it? You are reshaping your heart, but not from you'll never amount to anything, but from the perspective of God's truth, which says you are now joint heirs with Christ, and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, and on and on. And then the last point, I really encourage you to do a word inventory every night. Around Eastlake and all of our campuses, you'll hear this phrase, uh, we inspect what we expect. In other words, you just don't hope something's going to happen. If you want something to happen, you need to see and check it out regularly, inspect it to see if it actually is happening. One of my favorite Winston Churchill quotes is, no matter how grand your plan, one should check every once in a while to see if it's working. Well, one of the keys to recovery, 12-step recovery, is to do a moral, a ruthless moral inventory, a fearless moral inventory. And then, if you're going to stay sober, you need to regularly do frequent checkups on your path to sobriety. How am I doing Am I walking wisely, or am I taking small steps back to what got me using in the first place? Well, that's the principle to hear. Every evening, as you settle on down, you say, how did I do with my words today? Did I bring life, or did I bring death? Did I say something that I need to repent of and make right? And here's the biblical precedent, Psalm 139. Investigate my life, O God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine me and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. The wise person welcomes this, and not just welcomes it, but initiates it. Now, for some, this approach to life is a little uncomfortable. But please, remember Dr. Semmelweis. For decades, so many would die because the medical community would not buy into what he was saying. As a matter of fact, there's something in psychology now called a Semmelweis reflex, and here's what it is. The knee-jerk reflex to reject new evidence without investigation or experimentation because it goes against what has been accepted or practiced. Let's not do this. Instead, Let's use the incredible power of our words to save lives, our own and others. Before I pray, I want to invite you to grab your connection card here. And this is a really great resource and help right now. On one side, it starts out by, my next right step is. And maybe today, something that was said through God's word might just be like troubling you and and, and you see a path. You see something that, that God would have you to do. You feel something right. Well, the odds of you actually doing it go up exponentially if you say, this week I will, and you write it there. One, you're going to drop it in the offering box after the service, and we have a team of people that pray over these. So you're going to have a bunch of people supporting you in prayer. Also, by the way, there is a word inventory that is part of the discussion guide for this series, this message, and you can find it on your phone app or online on the website, and that'll really help you if you really want seriously want to spend the evenings, as I said before, doing a word inventory of your life. Let's pray. Lord, we give you praise, and I thank you, Lord God, for every person in this room, every person hearing this message. Your word calls them the apple of your eye. Each one of them can be described like Abigail described David as your treasure that you keep in your treasure pouch close to your heart. So, Lord God, for these that you love so much, I pray you would help us, Lord God, to understand the power of our words and then to use our words afresh to bring life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.